so the, the, the title of what Congressman Simpson, who's the second district from Idaho, put together is a Columbia Basin Initiative. And I'll just talk generally about uh, Congressman Simpson. He's, he's actually really a friend of the Tri-Cities. Um, he's been either the, the chair or the ranking member of the House Energy and Water Appropriations Committee. He still serves as the ranking member. Uh, for that, and in his tenure there, he has has really partnered with us on funding and appropriations for Hanford cleanup, and then funding uh, for research at Pacific Northwest National Lab. So I want to start off by not you know bashing Congressman Simpson, but but saying you know how he's worked with our community and the, the good job that he's done in the past. And and one of the things that he's done in Idaho in his second district, uh, he facilitated the creation of the Boulder White Clouds, which is now known as the Sea Slanders Wilderness Area, probably the last wilderness area that will ever be created, you know, potentially in the United States. Uh, worked bringing really uh, opposing groups together and, and formed this collaborative, worked on it for over 10 years to actually pull it off. Uh, part of his district is Redfish Lake, and that's essentially the end of the Salmon River in Idaho. And that relates to fish return rates and native fish for a specific salmon species. That, that's a big part of his proposal. I'll run through here in a minute. And then he's got a, a chief of staff that works for him in DC and runs his operation named Lindsey Slater. And he's from Eastern Oregon. And so he's you know, relatively local for us and has that perspective of, of our you know, Columbia Basin region. I thought the best way maybe to um, you know, talk about Congressman Simpson's plan is actually to share his um, presentation that I just got off of, of the website there. So if everybody can see this, the site says the Northwest Energy SAMA concept. I thought I'd just run through it pretty quickly without spending a lot of time of it. And then we'll, we'll get into some, some other talking points. Um, and again, this is coming from Congressman Simpson as Chief of Staff, Lindsey Slater. I'll, I'll just try to give some, some local perspective maybe on what he's proposing. So uh, Bonneville Power Administration is the federal agency, obviously, that, that operates the dams on both Lower Snake and uh, throughout the Northwest. And they do have some, some financial challenges. Essentially, their, their charter or what they operate under the federal government says that, that they have to set up their rates and their operations to, to match what uh, basically what it costs them. And that sets the rates that then they sell power to our local utility districts and many other similar organizations throughout the Northwest. Um, they, they continue to see their, their costs go up, but they're not able to pass those costs on to shareholders because of some federal regulation. So they do have some financial challenges. Um, there has been since the nineties, a long string of litigation relating to the lower snake river dams that are faced by power companies um, and agricultural concerns on irrigation. Uh, and I, I'll say prior companies, not only just in the Lower Snake River dams, but just in relicensing dams, hydropower operations throughout the Northwest. There's a couple slides later there. It shows a map. We can talk about that. And then this is his statement saying Idaho salmon and steelhead numbers are near extinction. And I'll just make the distinction that he's talking about native fish. So when he's talking about fish that are near extinction, in his opinion, that relates to fish that aren't grown in hatcheries. And, and that's a distinction we wanna keep in mind as we talk about this together. So he's basically talking on this slide about ending the salmon wars that we've talked about. There's been, going back to the mid nineties, uh, and at that time was one of the first lawsuits against Bonneville Power Administration. There was a deep drawdown of all the Lower Snake River dams. I know up the river in Lewiston and Clarkston, they had a, a deep drawdown, basically opened Lower Granite Dam, so it would show if there wasn't a dam here, what would it look like? And, you know, it, it really changed the landscape up there. Uh, but there have been billions of dollars spent on this litigation and lawsuits. It hasn't really changed anything, but they keep on coming up. Um, and he's suggesting that we can have people and fish, not people versus fish. And he's saying it's more about salmon and dams, it's really about building our, our local economies here in the Columbia Basin. He's got these categories. Uh, to invest in agriculture, clean energy, local economies, and more. We're all totally supportive for investing in those areas. That's really what we do in economic development. It benefits our communities. Um, but he's proposing that, you know, there would be some funding that would come out of the fact that over a period of time, we would breach these lower Fort Snake River dams. That, excuse me, that funding would come here to the Tri-Cities, uh, up Snake River into Lewis and Clarkston throughout the Northwest. And we'll we'll run through these slides and kind of go through what he's what he's talking about. So he's got some some dollars for agriculture infrastructure. 
uh, talking about, um, you know, nutrient research, which is kind of like all shoreline activities, especially when you get, uh, you know, animals and irrigation around any watershed, you're going to have uh, some sediment issues. So putting some money towards that. The big one here is Snake River Transportation, $3.6 billion, essentially what he's proposing in breaching the dams, uh, because right now that is the main transportation corridor for most of the wheat that's grown on the Palouse. And so he's proposing to put that into uh, shifting that freight onto rail and trucks, you know, from Lewis and Clarkson and then all the way down the Snake River that would come through the Tri-Cities and in different proposals, either create more barge load loading facilities here in the Tri-Cities and augment what we already have or run trains all the way down uh, the Columbia River to Portland, Vancouver and, and downstream ports to load ocean going ships rather than barging it down in that, that middle facility. That takes a lot of rail and infrastructure uh, development up, up river. And then he's also talking about more of impact locally, but reconfiguring the irrigation, that's the lower Snake River, which our local uh, irrigators benefit from. So they have pickups that go into the river and there'd be money there that would help them move those pickups and then reconfigure and repower potentially if they needed to in, in those cases. The power that comes from the jams, and just to give you some, some context, uh, the lower Snake River dams, all four of them together, produce somewhere around a gigawatt of power uh, per hour. So they're, they're uh, basically rated just over a thousand megawatts or one gigawatt. That's roughly about what the Columbia Generating Station produces locally uh, from Energy Northwest. And so what he's proposing here is that they would take $10 billion out of federal funding to let BPA replace that clean for power. And, and hydropower, the great thing about hydropower besides the fact that it's renewable is that you can schedule it. Essentially, you can turn on and off the turbines. You can open the floodgates or close the floodgates. And, you know, hydropower, the way it's configured now, you can schedule it. So you know that it's going to be on or off. You know when it's going to come up as renewables like wind and solar come on or offline based on the sun shining or the wind blowing. Uh, you can balance out the loads with hydropower. And so when he says clean, firm power replacement, he's talking about something else, which in our case would be nuclear. Which, which is a great uh, potential benefit for the Tri-Cities. And he's talking about the timing here that you know it needs to be online before they breach the dams. He also talks about energy storage, so pump storage and battery technology. And he's, he's for, he wants to add to research that's already ongoing at Pacific Northwest National Lab here, but then also build a, kind of a satellite campus up the river at Lewiston and Clarkston so that they would basically get that economic benefit from that and start to build some of the technology that could replace the uh, the power from the dams, and then also put about $2 billion in transmission resiliency and op optimization. And, and these, as we go through them, I'm trying to give you a flavor for uh, the resiliency and optimization of the trans transmission network for BPA are, are upgrades that we need anyway. Whether the dams stay or not, we need that investment in that technologies because as we try to recruit companies here to the Tri-Cities, one of the things that we lack is more uh, plentiful power supply. If we're talking with a company right now that would have a 30 megawatt load, so, um, you know, much less than like what would come off these dams. And it's a challenge to go out and find that much power. BPA doesn't let our local utilities increase their power trends or their power capacity, like the point load that much. So they'd have to go and buy it on the open power market. So, so there are some things in Congressman Simpson's plan that that we all support because we need to do it for our whole region, uh, whether they, they end up breaching the dams or not. Uh, for BPA, we talked about some of their financial things, and this would basically increase their borrowing cap, which would help them financially. Um, one of the big costs that BPAs had to cover in their operations that then gets passed on to us, the rate viewers, uh, rate users, rate payers, is uh, actually the mitigation for fish. So over uh, the course of 45-ish years that all four dams have been in place, there's been a spend of something like $17 billion on fish passage for those four lower Snake River dams. He's saying in his plan, you wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. So it would reduce some of the costs for BPA um, and take that responsibility away from them. Here he's talking about salmon. So there's the $17 billion number that we've shown. And, you know, he's, he's talking about that there are more species that are listed today than there were in 1980. That is true, but when we get into data, just like any discussion, debate, or argument that we have in the public sector, 
everybody has their own data sources. And I'll say, um, I'm not a fish expert, but as you look at some of the data and you look at all of the time since the dams were built and you look at different sections of that time period, you can cherry pick or pick and choose what sections of time you wanna look at that back up a point that you wanna make. I would generally say that in 2010, since the dams have come in, there were more fish that came back in 2010 with dams in place. Since then, those numbers have dropped off, but we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, from Marie, uh, NOAA Fisheries National Oceanographic, I'm not sure what the two A's at the end uh, stand for, but the AA, um, they're basically the federal agency that covers all uh, marine fisheries. They have science and data that shows that there's something going on that relates to global warming going on in the Pacific. It, fishes, it affects all fisheries throughout the, the Pacific coast, whether they have dams on them or not. And so, you know, there's a counterpoint to be made to this slide that, that the attribution for why aren't fish coming back in bigger numbers has more to do, it's a much more complex equation than just the dams on the, the lower Snake River. He has this slide where he talks about, and here we can see, you know, we're here in the Tri-Cities. He talks about uh, smolt to adult ratio on the John Day River system and then the Yakima River system, and he talked about the number of dams and then what's going on. I just want to point out a couple of things on, on this slide. Um, number one, as we all know here locally, there's more dams on the Yakima River he hasn't even talked about. And so if he's trying to make the point that eight dams versus four dams, that you know, there's a reason that there's a better return rate here because they only have four dams. Well, we know that they have many more than four dams. So on the Yakima, at least, he missed that. I want to point something else out too, and I think this is part of what I'll talk about later, which you know is kind of guessing like where is he coming from? Why is he coming up with this plan and what he's what is he trying to do? What he left out on this map, which this is the Snake River here that starts in Burbank and, and comes up through the four lower Snake River dams. Here at Lewiston and Clarkston, you got the clear water coming in over here. Uh, this is the Grand Ron going back into uh, Oregon. This is the Salmon River. So this is where we talk about Redfish Lake is down here somewhere, kind of at the end of the Salmon River. He's got a dot right here, and this is the Hell's uh, Canyon complex of three non-fish passage dams that are owned by Idaho Power. And the Snake River actually doesn't stop here. It goes all the way up this twisty part of Idaho. It then goes through the Lower Snake River Basin through Southern Idaho, which is their main agricultural producing region. And its headwaters are back up here outside of Yellowstone Park. Um, I looked up this, this NOAA marine fisheries that we talked about, and they have a biological opinion on salmonoid, which are salmon and steelhead species. And when they talk about the historical significance of the whole Snake River Basin, which includes all of Southern Idaho, which isn't shown on this map, they talk about when these dams were put in that do not have fish passage and are owned by an investor owned utility, not by a public entity like BPA, like these dams are, it cut off about three quarters of all the habitat or salmonoid um, spawning grounds up the river. So there's not been any salmon or steelhead that used to go to the Pacific Ocean, just like the fish you know, that come up the Salmon River do. They used to come down the snake before these dams were built. And so as we talk about what he's going for, I want you to keep that in mind um, as we go through this. So he talks about ending the salmon wars. This is another important slide. So essentially in this compromising that he's proposing, they would breach the dams in return, environmental groups that have been filing these lawsuits over the operation of the dam as it affects Endangered Species Act and the salmon recovery, um, that it would all lock in all major dams that produce more than five megawatts of the Columbia Snake and Willamette Basins, extending their licenses from 35 to 50 years. It would also halt all litigation. So any of these environmental groups that before could file a lawsuit that would essentially potentially change the operation of the dams, they couldn't do that for 35 years if this passed. That's what he's proposing. And then uh, remove some of the indemnification and mitigation from the dam owners, which as we talked about, isn't just BPA, it's also investor owned utilities. We've got a Vista out of Spokane, Idaho Power in Southern Idaho, Seattle Power and Light, which owns dams up on the Pend Oreille River. You know, there's many privately owned companies that own dams and have to go through their licensing process and also get sued by environmental groups. This is an interesting one because he has some collaboration from some environmental groups, but not all of them. In fact, uh, Center for Biological Diversity, Water Watch of Oregon, Wild Fish Conservancy, and, and Conservation Angler as four examples that signed one letter 
aren't in favor of this. They basically said we'd never give up our ability to litigate because that's our power to make sure the federal government enforces the Endangered Species Act. And so he doesn't have uh, everyone on the same page as it applies to what he's proposing. And, and that's really a concern. So here's, here's the Columbia Basin dams. He's got the four lower Snake River dams here in red. All the rest of them are green. So you can see how many dams there are on what's essentially the Columbia uh, River system as it goes up in here into the Ponderay and Clark Fork River, the Snake River that we talked about, and the Salmon River, the Grand Ronde. Uh, down here is the Willamette and, you know, of course, the main Columbia that, that we're familiar with. So when you look at all these dams, what he's proposing is we'll take these four out and then everybody else for 35 years is free of any litigation. And the environmental groups that have been very, you know, have sued the federal government or dam operators many, many times aren't willing to necessarily give that up. Some are, but, but some aren't as well, but that's what he's proposing. So, you know, this is essentially getting the lower snake river to go to a free row, uh, free flowing state, which is what the dam breaching would do. And he's basically saying to take it out in stages. So take the earth that's on the side of the concrete dam and open that up and keep the concrete dam. I guess he's trying to do it to say, well, if it doesn't work, we can always put the dam back in place. But the real, realistically, from a cost standpoint and an appropriation standpoint, if he was ever able to get it passed before, you know, once the earthworks come out, the, the dams really aren't going to go back in. We talked about this watershed partnerships and, and nutrition management, which is important for ag as it is around any watershed, investing in communities. And again, you know, you'd look at this and go like, well, there's a lot of money that could come to the Tri-Cities. But, but that's kind of the, the issue that we're talking about for Fort Lewis and Clarkston, because as I said, when you draw down, you take that dam out, their waterfront, which is basically a series of levees that was built by the Corps of Engineers in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, is basically going to border on some mud flats. And so this would go to kind of restore that river shoreline, um, create this new center for advanced energy storage in Lewis and Clarkston and have it, I guess, uh, related to PNNL, but, but PNNL has been very clear Although they're listed in this proposal, they weren't consulted in the preparing this. And so, you know, what would that look like? How would it operate? We're not sure. Economic development and compensation funds. Again, money would flow into us. Product would be a part of that. There would be, you know, essentially uh, money that came in uh, to try to mitigate some of the impacts of taking the dams out. And then, you know, he's got a picture, which is probably the Salmon River, and he's saying this is what the Snake River would look like again in the future. A few years ago, there's a report that came out. It was funded by the um, uh, Paul Allen, you know, one of the co-founders of Microsoft. He has a nonprofit, and they funded an economic study that basically said if you took out the dams on the Lower Snake River, it would open up so rec so much recreational opportunities like river rafting and jet boating and stuff that we can't do today. It would be a huge economic boon for you know the the affected shoreline of the Snake River, and that's really in question. I mean, again, it's one group's opinion. But if that were the case, if you had that much economic growth out of recreation, like often places like Riggins, Idaho or Salmon, Idaho would be five or 10 times the size that they are. They do have recreational opportunities. They haven't seen the economic impact of those recreations. So, so there's, you know, both sides of the issue. I'm just trying to, to give some perspective as we walk through this. Um, again, here, here's where he's coming from. He's trying to say, we, we want to balance these needs out. We want the fish to come back, but we also want to take care of everybody that would be impacted by the dams. Um, for that, he does have the tribes here. And I'll say like up the river, the Nespers tribe is a very uh, vocal proponent of this proposal. They uh, are dedicated to trying to bring the fish back uh, or what, you know, because of their heritage, the fish, big part of their, of their, um, their history and a big part of their culture. They, they want the fish to come back in the numbers that, that were there before the dams were there. So commonly asked questions, predators, there are predators lower down, you know, further down the Columbia River, uh, sea lions that eat a lot of salmon, orca, obviously there is this other issue with orca, you know, tying it into lower Snake River salmon, say that's a big food stock and there's not enough of them, they're starving. Um, that's really debatable. Orcas eat uh, fish from all the the rivers on the northwest. It's kind of hard to attribute that it's if you take these four dams out, the orca would come back in bigger numbers. I think that's very debatable. Uh, Idaho, the state of Idaho, and different utility districts do get power, and they do because there are many small utility districts that would be similarly set up to our local ones that are in Idaho. So you know they would lose access to that. Um, 
These are the dams that have to be bypassed. They're not used for flood control. These are run of the river dams, so they don't keep as much water back behind them. If there was a flood event, uh, floods would be controlled further down the Columbia. Uh, they're not used as that. And then I want to bring this up. What happens if we just fight, which is kind of what they're suggesting. If we just let it go on, you know, what happens? And, you know, the latest lawsuit led to the environmental impact statement being uh, compiled and produced by the by the uh, Bonneville Power Administration, Brought, came out last year with it, and it basically said, from an environmental point of view, that that you know there might be some changes in operation to help fish, but there was too big of an economic impact uh, on all of our region by taking the dams out, and that there isn't science that would lead to really healthy fish recovery. So they're suggesting, like, if we don't, you know, take the congressman's plan, then what's going to happen? And a couple of uh, examples that he brought up in the past of communities that went through federal uh, litigation and regulatory changes that led to changes in federal agency, like the spotted owl in the forest industry, Klamath Basin, um, in taking out some dams down there that weren't power producers. I'll just say on the spotted owl, the, the difference here, and I, I, you know, we talked about my history a little bit. I grew up on the Idaho Western border. My dad was in the timber industry. And so we lived through uh, in the eighties and nineties and, and towns that we lived in what happened because of, you know, kind of a uh, similar issue with spotted owl or, you know, in the interior uh, for service lands, it was about low cost timber sales. And I'll just say that the difference is that in those cases for timber sales to go on in light of an endangered species like spotted owl, there had to be a huge amount of federal work that could stop and basically stop timber sales, stop what was going on by just defunding the programs. And that's what happened. The, the situation that we're in today, those dams are there, they operate, they give power. There's, they're organized differently in the federal legal system. And so, you know, it takes the kind of the burden of making something change and happen to this side versus that side that it has to happen. In this case, the environmental groups have the burden of changing the way the dams are operated to get what they want. And in the spotted allocation, the, it was reversed. They could get what they want by stopping federal funding. The federal funding in the case of the dams isn't going to go away. They've got a bigger burden from a litigation standpoint to be able to do that. So I think that's you know an important uh, point to, to to point out. We are not in favor of uh, Simpson's plan. I went through a few, few why doing the the car the history about about creating this this uh, wilderness for white uh, and working collaboratively. You know, it tells a story about uh, county commissioners that are totally opposed to the environmental groups. Over the course of the 10 years, they were coming together and come up with some common solutions. So I think he has that tree of, you know, um, creating questions or solve problems. Um, there is litigation fatigue every against it. You know, there's just a, an ongoing battle because there are environmental groups. I've list a couple of them. There's a lot more. Ultimately, they want to take the Snake River dams out. And they don't just want to take the Snake River dams out. They want to take the dams out further up the Snake River that we talked about that, that have a much larger impact on Southern Idaho, which is Congress's territory or his legislative district. They want to take the dams out all the way down the Columbia. So, you know, um, this idea of like, well, let's get them to back off the litigation and we'll give them something, which is lower Snake River dams. You know, I think that's where he's coming. He thinks that he can mitigate that and, and you know, way. He's going for Congress. That's just my guess. Stronger and stronger on it. Uh, last two years as a representative for House, and and his opponents become are becoming more and more, um, I'd say, radical. Um, and and you know, Congressman Simpson very generally is a, a, a moderate Republican. He gets more extreme Republican opposition, and his his district's changing too. So he might be thinking about like, what do I do after I get done being a congressman? Maybe he's thinking about lobbying. Many of them do. That might be part of his, uh, what he's talking about. And I, re I really think, though, and, and we some groups have brought it up before, but protecting the Snake River complex. You know, when you look at the marine fisheries, no marine fisheries, and they talk about the Snake River Basin, and the first thing they say is that three quarters of the Snake River Basin is blocked by the you know lower Hell's Canyon complex of dams for fish passage. You can kind of see where they're coming out from an endangered species restoration point of view. They're kind of saying like. 
we have three dams, you know, further up the state that don't even pass any fish. And that would have, if they, if there was ever, you know, trying to take those dams out or add fish passage to them, which would be hugely expensive, it would be an impact on his ratepayers in Southern Idaho. So I think, I think that's part of, you know, where he's coming from. He hasn't publicly said that, but I think that has to be part of why. And for us locally, I'll just generally give the reasons why not for, for us in, in the Tri-Cities. So nationally, when you look at it, um, you know, there is ongoing discussion about an infrastructure bill that would be the next move of the federal Congress right now. And if you look at it, they're talking about one trillion ish dollars, maybe a little bit more. But if you divide a trillion by all 50 states, realizing that there is a, a big discrepancy in between Rhode Island and California. But if you just split it equally, every state would get out of one trillion would get somewhere around 20 billion dollars. So if Idaho and Washington, if the whole delegation said, yeah, this is the most important thing that we need to do, Congressman Simpson's plan costs between 33 and 35 billion dollars. If our two states together only got $40 billion, is everybody going to go along with that? That's a big non-starter. And, and the next bullet point, their lack of uh, support from the House committee chair, that's a Democrat that's in, in charge of all the appropriations. He's basically said, you know, it's not going to happen from our local delegation. They're not supportive because there isn't, you know, there isn't a clear direction on this. I think we saw that uh, two years ago when Governor Inslee had run, huh? his statewide task force run. trying to, again, get fired and bring all the they met for about a year, spent $750,000. They a presentation uh, where I was at the time. They basically said, yeah, you know, we met a lot of times. We actually are nice Don't people. We like to meet, but we can't Don't agree on any it's too complex of an issue. And, and that's essentially yeah. where the uh, their lack of congressional support because are opposing sides and there isn't clear, uh, you know, unity behind the Simpsons plan or plan really. And, you know, the, the dam breaching organizations, diversity, like we talked about, some environmental groups support the congressman's plan, some don't, you know, it doesn't have everybody on board with it. Transportation issues, um, in, in the slide there, there was a, some billions of dollars that would uh, redo the transportation infrastructure between the, the Lewiston and Clarkston and the tri city so they can still get that grain down the river. They're talking about spending billions of dollars and improving rail lines and, you know, trucking and then marine terminals to load barges down here instead of up there. Uh, that's really costly. And, and I'll say that the numbers are using came from the environmental impact statement that B BPA did before last year. And those numbers are, are way underestimate what it would actually cost to add to transportation to be able to do that. <laughs> The other side of it is, is carbon issues. You know, the, the marine fisheries talks about salmon recovery being more affected by what's going on with the warming of the Pacific Ocean, affecting all salmon in the Pacific, whether it's a dam or not. And that's driven by carbon emissions and global warming. And so if you switch from barges moving grain down the river to Portland and Vancouver, trucks and, tra and uh, trains, you'd increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere by a Boardman coal electrical fired uh, production plant about every five or six years. So, you know, essentially you could say the reason the fish aren't coming back is because of carbon. And you're going to increase the carbon by taking the dams out. So it, it gets to be kind of a cyclical loop that sort of defeats their purpose. There's not good fish science that says for sure, if you only take these four dams out and then you protect every other dam, that you're gonna get more fish coming back. We talked about what's going on in the Pacific Ocean. There's there's good science behind that, that, that it doesn't necessarily work. And like we talked about before, once you take the dams out, you're realistically not gonna put them back in. That's that's just gonna happen. And I think just in general terms, it's not good public policy, we'd call it bad public policy, to talk about mitigating impacts um, in something that the science is there to, that says for sure, if we do this, the fish will come back. We don't know if that's absolutely the case, but to try to mitigate that with more federal deficit spending just is bad public policy. And, and really for us locally, um, if this plan were to come to fruition, it would affect our quality of life. We would see more trucks on our roads, which we already have some traffic congestion problems here in the Tri-Cities as it stands we'd start to see more rail congestion. You know, we have at grade crossings that, that cause um, traffic congestion when a train's going across the tracks. That would only increase under this plan. And then uh, reduction of clean power access. You know, we don't have blackout or brownout situations like they saw this winter in Texas. 
poor in California in previous years, but that's because we have the baseload power that, that the lower Snake River dams are a big part of. You know, just, just the last dam on the system, um, Ice Harbor, when we get to our peak load, which actually comes in August because all the irrigation pumps are on and we're all running our air conditioners, they actually use Ice Harbor as, as almost like a storage system. So when it peaks, they've got the water behind the dam, they can bring the turbines online, that means that, that helps us not cause brownouts or blackouts because there's so much load on the entire grid and system. And so, you know, we're not willing to give that up for our quality of life, as well as, you know, as the state keeps on adding more electrical vehicles, there's going to be a bigger electrical load. I just talked about when we bring companies in, we can't meet some companies that would like to move to the Tri-Cities and provide jobs for us. We can't meet their electrical load. So if we take out a gigawatt on what we're feeding into, it really doesn't work for us on that that uh, local point of view. So those are the slides um, that I'll, I've put together. And I think I stopped the screen share. So.